Hi everybody, Kurt with Two Brothers Hobby, and we're here today with Aries RC's latest offering, the P51D Mustang 350. Um, they offer it in two different versions, RTF, ready to fly, which is what we have here on the bench with us today, and also an RFR version, ready for receiver, meaning you're going to have to provide your own transmitter, receiver, main flight battery, and battery charger. Uh, both kits come with a fully assembled painted fuselage with the motor installed, the ESC installed, and the servos. Ours additionally has the receiver installed since it came with the radio system. Both kits do include the main wing with the aileron servo installed and uh, everything pre-hinged and ready to go. Now on our RTF version, we did get the transmitter. It's a six channel 2.4 gig transmitter. They include the batteries for that. And we also got our charging system, uh, which is our charger, our, D our, our AC adapter, our DC charger, LiPo charger. It's actually a balancing charger for the included 11.1 volt uh, 3S battery pack. So um, both kits do include two different prop variations. They have a four blade and a two blade. The four blades for more scale flying, the two blades for more performance. And uh, they do include two different spinner configurations to accommodate your two or four blade props. Both kits do come with the removable landing gear, uh, three hardware bags, and a screwdriver for assembly. The one thing you want to do is look at the instructions carefully before you begin uh, the assembly of your, of your Mustang. And uh, ours did come with a couple of addendums, which are just slight changes to the manual or instruction steps. So you're going to want to look through those as well. Now, the first thing you want to do is get your battery charging, because I guarantee it'll take us less time to assemble the model than it will for the battery to charge. Um, from empty, you know, about an hour, 1.4 hours roughly, to charge it up from cutoff when the uh, ESC actually detects low voltage and says, OK, enough's enough. And it stops it at safe uh, low voltage levels. It'll take about an hour, 1.4 hours to charge up. Um, on ours, they usually ship at storage voltage, so it's only going to take about 45-50 minutes probably to charge it to full. So we're going to go ahead and get started with that, and then we'll move on to the assembly. Now the first step in the instruction manual is to center your aileron servo and complete that linkage connection. In order to do so, you're going to want to connect the um, uh, aileron servo lead into the receiver where it shows uh, aileron. It indicates AIL for aileron. Uh, check the polarity, make sure it matches with what they installed in the factory on your RTF kit, and just plug it into the receiver. Now, uh, it requires power to do this, to do this uh, centering of the servo. Uh, we actually have a couple little battery packs, external batteries. Uh, this is just a standard one. It takes four AA batteries. It's going to provide the adequate voltage to the receiver for us to power it up since we've got our main flight battery charging. If you don't have things like this, that's fine. Just pull your main battery off the charger, connect it temporarily to go through and center the aileron servo, and then put it back on the charger. Go ahead and install the batteries in your transmitter at this time. We're going to go ahead and close that. And then power on your transmitter. You're just going to move the switch you know, located here to the up position. Now, before you do so, make sure that your throttle of the left stick is all the way down. And um, then go ahead and your, your trims are centered. And we'll show you that in a second. Go ahead and power on your transmitter. You'll get a green light, a red light here. And then what we're going to do is go ahead and power up our receiver. So uh, looking at the way we're going to connect ours, um, we've got our receiver already installed in our RTF version. And uh, we're going to plug in a power, a power pack to that. Now, you can plug into any of the channels. Just make sure you put the black on the side of the black that's indicated with the rest of the servo connections. And that's going to go ahead and power up our receiver. You'll hear the servos shake a little bit. And now the receiver's powered up, and you've got powered all your servos. You can verify that in your transmitter by moving the right stick or uh, in any direction, and you'll notice things start jiggling around. Um, now, in this controller, up and down is your elevator, left and right is your aileron. We're going to be focusing on the aileron. So you're going to want to make sure that the aileron trim is centered. So we're looking at the right stick. That's this bottom trim here. You can move that left and right to adjust where, this, where the position of the servo stops or centers out. You're going to want to make sure that's right in the center before we make any adjustments. So with our servo connected, um, we can go ahead and move our aileron, that right stick, to the right and left, and we can see the movement. We want to make sure that when it's centered out, it's relatively uh, perpendicular to the body of the, um, of the servo itself. And as you see here, it's pretty close. So this is acceptable. If it were heavily offset one direction or another with the trim centered on your radio system, if you already had your trim stick centered, um, what you can do is take that screw off um, that's indicated right here in the center and just and move it. There's little splines on this actual servo horn, and you can move it one click to the left, one click to the right. Try to get it as horizontal as possible, as it's indicated here. We're in good shape here, so we're going to go ahead and proceed with the, uh, with the uh, servo connections. Since ours is centered, all we're going to do is take our little uh, silicone tubing uh, that we have that comes included in the kit. We're going to slide it up onto the actual clevis itself. And all that does is provide some constant pressure. Um, since these do pull apart, if you have to adjust it, you can take a screwdriver and twist it in there and these will pull apart and there's a little pin. You don't want those to come apart in flight, so you're going to slide that little neoprene or, or little um, silicone uh, tubing up across that. 
And there we can see we've, we've put both of our little washers up on the clevis. If your ailerons are not level, and these are your two ailerons, if after centering your servo, uh, the ailerons are not level, you can go ahead and adjust the linkage to where they're nice and level. You want to you want to have the trailing edge of the of the aileron and the trailing edge of the wing to match like it is here. You can always adjust um, uh, the clevises themselves. I just do uh, one turn out or one turn in and check it again on whichever aileron needs to move, and uh, you'll find that you'll be able to get those to level up really well uh, with the servo in a center position. So looking at the wing in this position, uh, we can get an idea of which way the landing gear goes. Um, this is the front of the aircraft. And we're going to want the uh, landing gear sweeping forward. So if you notice, the uh, brackets themselves have an angle to them. So if you put that level on the wing, it's going to sweep the wheels forward. Make sure you have the skirts going to the outside uh, of the uh, wings, towards the wing tips, and just figure out which way uh, you need to adjust or which way you need to swap these around to find where they sweep forward, this direction on the wing, and then the skirts are towards the wing tips, and then slide them into the brackets. It'll be a snug fit. You may want to use a screwdriver to help push it in. Ours are going in pretty well. I'll make some final adjustments after I get the other one in place. So with both landing gear in place now, uh, heading in the right direction, this is the front of the aircraft. We've got our landing gear sweeping forward. If we hold our wing level, we can see that they sweep slightly forward. You're going to want to check the alignment of both wheels as well. Uh, looking again at the nose of the aircraft, uh, what you're going to want to have is, is these to be parallel to one another or even slightly towed in, and you can twist them slightly in the bracket, the metal inside the plastic bracket, to where they're just slightly towed in. This is going to give you the best handling on the ground. Um, towed out wheels, it'll want to zigzag on you, so it'll be real kind of squirrely on the ground when you try to taxi and take out and land. Um, with, a, with a level or slight tow in, um, it tends to track more true, and it won't want to wiggle on you when you try to taxi or, uh, or uh, come in and land and, and uh, roll out. The next step is to attach the uh, wing to the main wing to the fuselage. In order to do so, we're going to have to plug in the aileron lead first. And here's your radio connection. Um, again, uh, you can see on the inside uh, there's actually a slot or an empty plug that says aileron. We're going to plug it in there. Just pay attention to the polarity and make sure it matches the other servo leads. And with that securely in place, then we'll go ahead and feed the wing uh, into the fuselage. And we're going to do that by starting with the tail end. Uh, of the main wing. So if we look at it from this direction, we're going to go ahead and slide it in this way and may, make sure you pay attention to the uh, aileron servo lead so it stays out of the way. You may have to use your your other hand and kind of dig that wire around a little bit, make sure it stays out of the way of everything and it isn't overlapping the, uh, the mating of the wing and the fuselage. So now I've got that tucked away pretty well. We'll go ahead and slide it into the rear of the aircraft. There we go. And then you're going to want to make sure that the uh, nose is flush here by the battery cover. And then we're going to use the uh, uh, 3x30 millimeter screw. Now inside of our hardware bag, we can see here that um, there's one big long machine screw. So we're going to go ahead and use that to attach the main wing. Don't take it too tight. You just want to get some, you know, a little bit of tension on it. If you can catch the little uh, plastic washer in the light, you can see it just start to dimple inwards and you know you've got enough pressure to be able to hold the wing in place. Our kit came with an addendum for the installation of the horizontal stabilizer uh, and tail section. So we're going to follow those instructions. What it's going to have us do is install the uh, horizontal stabilizer, which came with your kit. You're going to do it in this orientation. So facing there, looking at the side of the rear of the aircraft, um, we have a control horn located on the bottom side here. We're going to want that tail feathers towards the back. We're going to want to go ahead and insert from this side. Otherwise, we hit our control horn, insert it into the fuselage, and put it in place. On the underside of the fuselage, you're going to see two holes, and that's where we put our 25-millimeter uh, uh, button head screws in. There's two of those, two holes and two screws. If you've got everything properly aligned, you slide it, it'll slip down inside of the uh, receiver pocket, and you'll be able to uh, tighten it up uh, into the fuselage. Now, you don't have to take it too tight at all. You just want to take it to where it feels like it's starting to get a little bit snug and stop there. Uh, that's plenty enough. doesn't take a whole lot of pressure uh, since it's pinning the horizontal stabilizer to hold it in place through flight. And we're going to leave our clevis disconnected for now because we're going to go through and connect the radio system again and center that uh, elevator servo before we connect it to the control horn. The next step is centering the elevator and rudder control services. We're going to go ahead and use our battery. Um, even though it's on a charger, we're going to go ahead and pull it off. 
and use our flight battery for this. It's okay to, to hook up our flight battery at this point, even though we're messing around with everything because our prop is, is uh, still removed. It's not installed, so it's not a dangerous situation. You notice on the bottom of the aircraft, you have a battery hatch cover. Go ahead and twist the uh, keeper out of the way for that, and then remove the battery hatch cover. Down inside that hole, you'll locate the um, battery lead, the connector lead. There it is. We're gonna go ahead and connect the battery. First thing we're gonna do though is turn on our transmitter. So go ahead and turn your transmitter back on. Again, making sure that all your trims are centered on all four of your channels. Those are the four sliders here. And you can slide those just by, you'll hear a, a heavy detent or a click. Make sure it's in the center position because what we're gonna do is center out our control surfaces so we have uh, as symmetrical a throw as possible on each of our control surfaces. So everything's centered. Go ahead and turn on our transmitter. Always turn on the transmitter first. And, and turn it off last. Think of it that way. When you power up your aircraft, turn the transmitter on first, then put the battery in. That way you know you always have positive control of the aircraft. Um, when you get finished flying, disconnect the flight battery and then turn off the transmitter. So we've turned on our transmitter. We're gonna go ahead and collect our, connect our flight, uh, main flight battery. This just slips down inside of the hole uh, here. That's provided the battery location. You can tuck the little balancing lead, which is this white lead. Just tuck it down inside. And then you're going to connect your main lead. And this is keyed so you can't get the polarity wrong. And then shove that wire down in there as well, out of the way of the hatch cover. Those tones you hear are the initialization or the reading of the ESC, electronic speed control. That's what actually controls your motor. Um, it actually sends a pulse back through the motor. So the beeping you hear is actually coming from the motor itself, uh, registering how many cells were connected. And it beeped three times saying it's a 3S battery. Now the whole point of this step is to get our uh, linkage and our uh, from our control linkage and also our control horn to where it lines up. So if I move this linkage out of the way, I've got my radio system on, I move this linkage out of the way and I uh, level out our, our uh, elevator. This is a horizontal stabilizer. We want a straight line from the horizontal stabilizer into the elevator. So at rest, you want in the center position on the stick, you want that horizontal stabilizer and elevator lined up perfectly. That way the plane isn't pitching up or nosing down and you have to make adjustments or adjust your trim or anything from neutral. So uh, what we're gonna do is connect into the lowest or the farthest connection on the control horn. You see there's multiple options here. We've got four different locations. We're gonna be connecting with the furthest uh, uh, one away from the root or the, or the outermost hole. So if we uh, let the elevator go into rest, completely level, we can check the alignment so right now it looks like it's out a little bit. Now what you can do is go ahead and drive fit it with the clevis pulled apart. This actually pulls apart. There's a little tiny pin there you see. And uh, what we're gonna do is go ahead and insert it into the elevator control horn and get an idea of where it rests right now. So just with the pin slid through, you don't have to clamp, push the clevis back together. Um, just with the pin slid through, we can verify that our elevator and our horizontal stabilizer look pretty level. So as we move it through the range of motion, this is the right stick on the transmitter, up and down we can see that it flexes that elevator and then returns back to a neutral position. So this is ideal. Now if the clevis is too far in or away and uh, you know at rest when you connected it, it, uh, it looked like that when the stick was actually centered, you'd wanna go ahead and unscrew this clevis a little bit from the control linkage and that's gonna, that's gonna bring it out a little bit. Likewise, if it's too far out, you can screw it in, but you want this and now at rest setting dead level. So it looks pretty good here. So what we're gonna do now is snap our clevis together, and then take our little rubber or um, uh, silicone tubing piece and push it up on a clevis like we did with our ailerons to secure uh, that clevis in place so it won't come off during flight. And there's our completed uh, elevator uh, adjustment on the linkage. Everything's nice and neutral. Our trims are in the neutral position. If we look at our actual transmitter, our trim is right in the middle, which is good. What this is gonna allow us then is if we, when we take off and we get in the air, if it wants to slightly nose down or slightly nose up from level flight when it's under power, uh, we can make adjustments in the trim. If you notice, if I pull down, it trims the elevator up, which is gonna pitch the nose of the aircraft up a little bit. I have control now, symmetrical control. If I trim forward on a transmitter, it's pulling the elevator down, which is gonna pitch the nose down a little bit. And it's actually what it's doing is the air deflects on a, on a downward deflection. It picks the tail up and actually pushes the nose down. So this is what we want. In our neutral position on our trim, we want our elevator nice and horizontal on the uh, horizontal stabilizer. So we're going to go ahead and repeat the same step for the rudder, making sure that it vertically, when we look at it from the top, is nice and level with the vertical stabilizer. 
and then make adjustments accordingly and go ahead and secure the linkage. So now with everything connected, all of our control service is active, linkage in place, um, uh, keepers securely fa uh, fastened on the, the clevises themselves, it's ready for flight. The airframe is ready for flight. All we have to do is do our power plant or our, our prop and spinner. But uh, now is a perfect time with the radio system on to verify all the control service directions. So again, using the six-channel six channel transmitter that came with the RTF kit um, in mode two, which is again the, com the way it comes from the factory in North America, uh, this is where all your control channel assignments. So uh, the uh, left stick up and down is going to be your throttle. So all the way down is throttle off as you move it. Fully proportional control of the, uh, the throttle itself. If we take that left stick, we move it left and right. Left stick to the left is rudder to the left, which from the rear, the rudder should deflect in that direction. If you notice, left should move this way. Right should move this way. And again, this is looking from the rear of the aircraft. If we look at uh, the right stick, this is going to be our aileron and elevator controls. Right stick to the right, and we'll see the elevators def or the ailerons deflect in this in this position. The right aileron goes up from the rear. It goes up. Right to the right goes up, and the left goes down. Right to right stick to the left, and the left aileron goes up, and the right aileron goes down. So verify you have that proper direction control. We're going to pay attention to the reversing switches. Everything's right in this aircraft, but if we wanted to show how that worked, if I move my uh, rudder stick over to the left, and that happened to be wrong, I can look at my rudder channel, I can hit reverse, and now you'll see that it'll go the other way. So everything's right from the factory, so I'm going to leave those all in the down position. But uh, that's how you make those changes. The next step is to move on to our prop and spinner installation. Our four-bladed prop, again, has a smooth face on it. There you go, you can see the smooth face. If we look at the back, you can see that there's some pockets. This is the back side of the prop. So you want to make sure that the smooth face is facing outward. We're going to start off by using our flange nut first with the flange facing towards the prop. And we'll go ahead and slide that on. Four-bladed prop. Then the four-bladed spinner black plate. flat washer, our plain 3 millimeter nut, which doesn't have any locking, uh, nylon locking inserts to it, and then our nylon uh, lock nut. And then we finish it off with our spinner cap. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start off with the uh, plain nut that they include in the kit. And this is the plain nut. There's no flange on it or anything. Uh, it's not a lock nut. We're going to go ahead and put that on, on the prop shaft. And the important thing is, is we disconnected the battery. The radio system's off and the main flight battery's out. Always do this with a dead uh, aircraft. This is when you can get hurt. So we'll go ahead and slide that on until it's fairly well seated. And then the next step is we're going to install the uh, uh, two-blade prop on the shaft. So we're going to use, again, that rough a uh, back side with the molding lines in it towards the, the uh, plain nut. Slide that back and you'll feel it kind of key in there. It'll key in on that, on that nut. Now something important too is after we install the prop, we're going to fire, every get, get installed, we're going to fire it up and check the tracking. The tracking is when you look at a propeller uh, across its, um, its uh, uh, right in line with the propeller blades themselves. Tracking is as it goes around you'll see one blade and then the other blade appear uh, and it'll create, it should create a clean line. If you see it looks like it's wobbling back and forth, it's because the prop is slightly offset. You want to get that taken out as much as possible because that's going to impact not only performance, but also it's going to put extra wear and tear on the bushings or bearings inside the motor. So an easy way to do that, especially on this two-blade configuration, is let's say you put it in and you check it and your tracking's out a little bit, remove the prop, make sure you keep the motor shaft in the same position, rotate it at 180 degrees, and put it back on. And now it's going to seat differently on that backing nut, and you may see that that tracking. Now you can go, if that doesn't improve, if it improves or makes it worse, then what you can do is start back at your real original position and uh, then start rotating uh, on each of the flats. So just give it a little bit more rotation and try it in that position. If that's not good, take it a little bit further. But it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty much the, the, the foolproof way of getting this style prop and prop adapter to be able to uh, track in true. If you can't get it tracking properly, uh, you may have to switch out to a different prop um, or even a different backing nut if you've got some, uh, some issues from the factory. But typically I've found in almost all cases by doing a little bit of rotation on that motor shaft, 
you can get these style props to, to come in really nice and true. So we've got our backing washer on, our backing nut on there, a plain nut. We put that in place. And the next thing is to go ahead and install the spinner back plate in the washer. There are two spinner back plates provided with the kit. As you can see, one has two cutouts and one has four. So we're doing the two blade prop. We'll go ahead and start with the one with two. We'll go ahead and install it. It's in place. Now we'll go ahead and put the uh, washer. There's a couple of flat washers they include in the kit. Then the three millimeter flange nut. Flange nut looks like this. It has just a little bit of a flange on the end of it. We're going to put the flange towards the uh, washer. And then go ahead and sec secure the lock nut. That's the one with a little tiny nylon insert. If you notice it has a little tiny dark insert in it on the end there. That's a locking nut. We'll go ahead and take that down. And you don't have to take that down too tight at all. You just want to back it up against that, that uh, the last uh, flange nut that you put on there. There we go. And then the next step is to pop our plastic cap on. Well, our Mustang's finished and ready to go out for some flight testing. Um, one thing we're going to do before we take it off, even though we used an RTF kit, which ready to fly, we used all factory equipment and the locations they intended, is we always verify the CG, and that's the center of gravity, the balance of the aircraft. They cover that in the manual extensively, as well as a lot of good other tips, um, tracking the prop, how to adjust the, uh, the prop to get better tracking on a two blade or four blade. They talk about arming of the radio system, what position your throttle needs to be in, a lot of safety tips, things like that. So make sure you read through the manual. Don't use this video as a substitute by any means. But uh, we're going to check that CG. They do indicate the CG on the bottom of the wing. Center of gravity is if we take the aircraft and draw an imaginary line from the nose to the tail, this is our longitudinal axis. We're looking at, at the center of gravity, the balance point on that longitudinal axis, critical to all aircraft. They mark the CG on the bottom of the wing. Um, you can check it as they indicate uh, with the aircraft in the upright position, but what you'll find is it's very touchy. Since the majority of the mass of the aircraft is above the wing, it kind of makes it want to teeter-totter really, really quickly in both directions. So it's kind of difficult to get your fingers in the right location and you may get a false reading. What we do is we transfer the CG mark. We take the first compound angle of the wing right there where it kicks in right by the landing gear. We measure back to the uh, spar, which is where that CG is. And then we transfer those marks up on the top and give ourselves a little divot or a little piece of tape to reference. Then we turn the aircraft upside down. Always best to check your uh, low wing aircraft upside down. Uh, this makes things happen a little, less, a, little, a little less aggressively and gives you more accuracy on checking your CG. So when we check that CG point, we want the nose to come forward just like this. Now make sure you have your flight battery in when you're checking CG. You want it ready to fly, just don't power it on. You want all the weight in the aircraft though. So when we check the CG, we want the nose forward just like that. And that's nice, uh, slightly forward CG. It's going to give us good, smooth, stable flight, good control, good response, uh, nice landing speeds, things like that. Um, if you see that the CG is aft, the balance is aft and the, and the tail is tipping down, you never want that scenario, especially on a low wing, um, but on pretty much all aircraft, you don't want to have the tail heavy at all. Um, at the very least, you want it to be level, which is going to give you good aerobatic performance, preferably a little bit nose forward CG, and that's going to give you a good uh, scale response and, and good control over the aircraft. So last little tip from us, make sure you check that CG uh, on all aircraft, and it's just one of the best tips you can take. If you want more information on the P-51D Mustang, you can go to the Aries RC website at ariesrc.com. Good luck with your Mustang. I'm Kurt with Two Brothers Hobby, and thanks for watching.